sort of amazing to be here today. I mean, in 1966, uh, you see the way I'm dressed? Today is the first day that I've dressed oh this God, way in several God. decades. Yeah. <laughs> but, but to be taken seriously when you're discussing serious issues, in 1966, you had to wear a black suit and a tie and look totally respectable. Of course, I couldn't have a good Marsha P. Johnson pin on in those days, and I didn't. I hadn't even met her yet. But when I think back to how important it was, everyone lives with this dream or this idea that everything started with Stonewall. Well, I started in 1958. That was 11 years before Stonewall. And it was the Mattachine Society and my group, the Homosexual League of New York, that were the first people to, to go on radio, to go on live television taking questions, to publicly demonstrate the, the, the right to serve in the military, down with the Army Induction Center. And one of the things that we did, that that's a real legal imprint, was that Mattachine when we came here and said, we have the right to, we want to be served. And they refused us. Now, we had gone to Howard Johnson's, we had gone to the TikTok bar, we had gone to a couple other places and went in and said, we're homosexuals and we want to be served a cocktail. And they all just laughed and said, oh, no problem. <laughs> you know, they were not under the gun the way the people that ran Julius's was because they had trapped somebody here and they were laying a network where they'd have to pay off the police and grease the machines that were the corrupt system that ran New York City bars, especially New York City gay bars. So actually when we took this action, we were legally challenging the state laws that said it was illegal to serve homosexuals alcohol or to allow them to gather on your premises. That's the right of assembly. And by taking that legal action and setting that house of cards in order, we cracked the chain that held the village and held the gay community in this country locked in the hands of the criminal underground, the, the criminal gangs, all which owned every gay bar. There were no legitimately owned gay bars. We could not go, I went into a bar and started giving out Mattachine literature, 
They said, get him out of here. No one was interested in the Manichaean literature in those days until they said, get him out of here. Then everybody wanted to leave it. But most people in those days thought it was better. As long as people think we're all some sort of crazy, wild-looking people that they saw pictures in magazines or, you know, then they won't realize that normal-looking people like us are actually gay. And they won't. So in a way, there was a reluctance to be identified. They would say, oh, I don't want to be associated with that masculine woman or that drag queen or that person or this person. Maybe they were just snooty. They didn't want to be associated with poor people either, you know, Puerto Ricans or Latinos or African Americans. So anyway, Julius's will always be special in my mind because it was at one point in all the early struggles that I was actually able to make a footprint in history. And of course to be here. Well, thank you, Andy Hum. Andy Hum has done great coverage of this, of this whole city and the history. He has a regular film, free speech television on YouTube. It really gives you all the news from across the nation. So there are two reasons that Julius's are my favorite bar. First of all, it's because it was the place where we started the ball rolling to liberate our society from the mob. The second is a little bit more personal, and I hope you don't think it's a little bit too, uh, too flamboyant. But, uh, I particularly love Julius's because it was only by Julius's that I got my picture two times on the obituary page of the New York Times, and I'm still here at 84 years old to, to tell you about it and to hold this up. And say, I'm still here, and I'm still fighting. I'm the last guy to cheer, and I'm going to stay active as long as I can. Thank you all so much.